For our church, one prayer means God use me. One way that I really want God to use me is to bring people from the Anderson campus or the Clemson campus to um, Upstate Church Anderson. I know a lot of people last year had a really hard time finding a home church because before Upstate Church was there, um, I did have to find somewhere to go to church and it was really hard for me. And I don't want people to be in that place when they're moving away because college is a lot of change. And if there's anything that I can give people, I want to give them a place where they feel like they're at home. Our prayer would be for God to use us and he already is using us at First Baptist and I almost feel he brought us to Greenville to use us at First Baptist which is really cool <laughs> because we really had no purpose to come to Greenville but when we started serving in August it gave us purpose and we hope that people are able to see God through us in our serving um, during worship every Sunday morning. My prayer is that God would use me wherever I am. Um, right now at Upstate Church Anderson, he's using me to set up every Sunday morning. And so we get there around 7.30 or 8 and we, um, we, have to set up the whole, we have to set up the whole church because we're using a hotel actually. And so we have to set up like the, the stage, the lighting, the, the curtains, we have to set up the, like almost everything. And so after church we take that down, but um, that's just like one part of how I want God to use me, I would say. Um, Another way that I want God to use me is probably in my life, like on campus, like bringing others to church and bringing others to Him. For one prayer, I truly believe that when we are plugged into the church, when we are using our gifts to serve it, that's when the Lord will use us. So that's really my prayer, that He would use me. Um, it, with the natural giftings that's, that He's given me, but in a way that brings me closer to His body. As we enter this one initiative throughout uh, our campuses, it is our prayer that God will use us, our time, our talents, and of our financial resources to reach others for Christ. My prayer is that God would use me, and one way I've been seeing that is that, um, through my school, I've been inviting friends to church because it's just something that I love so much, and I have great relationships with everyone in my discipleship group, and. I always talk about church at school and everyone kind of gives me a look like, really church? And I'm like, yeah, like it's literally my second home and I just enjoy it so much. And it's just something I want to share with people at my school to be able to have the same experience I do. My prayer is that I just invite them and I've recently saw one of my best friends get baptized and it was really um, special to me because I was one of the people that brought her and encouraged her to come to church because she didn't really have a home church, and it was just something really great to share. Well, good morning, good morning. Last week we started the new series one, and it was introducing us to a two-year initiative. And if you're new to the church, maybe if this is your first uh, Sunday ever uh, attending, or maybe you're even first time you've ever even checked us out online, this will tell you a little bit about us. We're, we're pretty intentional. I mean, we seek the Lord's will ahead of time. And, and for the last two years, even through a global pandemic, we've been walking through something called All In. And, uh, and we have felt compelled by the Lord to kind of begin a new initiative for the next two years related to one. And uh, last week in particular, we talked about uh, our being one church. And the primary point of that was unity, to say that we're not just going to be tolerant of one another, uh, but we're actually going to be unified, a faith family. And see, I mean, that's, that's challenging for us because you're talking about five different uh, locations. Uh, in addition to that, a multitude of generations, because our church is multi-generational. And so every week when you're hearing these testimonies from various campuses and stuff like that, just take into account the, the, I guess in some sense, the variety of people who call Upstate Church, First Baptist Simpson, their home, and how God has really brought us together. So last week, one church. This is that I'm not just going to be tolerant of one another, but I want us to be promoters of unity, ambassadors of a unified church. One. But then today we're going to shift gears and we're going to add to that, not only are we one church, but we share one prayer. 
we share one prayer. If you have the, the one book, go ahead and turn to 26, page 26, I think has your um, notes. Uh, you can take some notes or pull up your app on your phone. If you haven't downloaded, it's a free download. And you can actually take notes on the app, email them to yourself, kind of a, a neat, cool feature, uh, and allows you to kind of keep track of, of the messages uh, from whatever campus, even if you're uh, looking online, you can do that. It's a great opportunity. But today, we're going to be talking about this one prayer, and here's the one prayer we want to pray together collectively for two years. God, use us. Would you say those three words with me? God, use us. That's our prayer. That ought to be our prayer collectively, but it's going to begin with us praying that individually. We've all got to individually uh, start with this idea we're going to talk about today, surrender. The only way we're going to individually pray, God, use us, is if we have surrendered our heart, if we've surrendered our life. It's never going to happen, all right? We can say it all day long. Remember, we can proclaim without it being part of our practice. We can say something that we don't really mean. And so I'm not just saying, I surrender. Sing songs on a Sunday morning. We could raise our hands. Get, we could get pretty emotional, to be honest with you. But all of that is useless if we're not truly singing from our heart, God, take me. God, use my life. God, this, what would be otherwise an insignificant life. Lord, would you, would you take it and would you use it? That ought to be our prayer. And so as we think about that, Take your Bibles, turn in, turn on your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah, Old Testament prophet. We're going to be looking at his, uh, his writing in chapter 6. And we'll begin reading in verse 1. And so we want to keep all of this in mind as we understand our next steps. This is the question. What is my next steps? If I really want to surrender, if my, if my prayer is truly, God use me, then, then how do I know what to do? Isaiah chapter 6, look with me at verse 1. Here's what Isaiah says. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Before we go on to verse 2, check this out. King Uzziah, a good king. And the reason it's significant that Isaiah says it's the year that he died is not because the emphasis is King Uzziah, but the emphasis is this is a bad year. I mean, if there's any simple way of just explaining what, what's setting up the context here is this is a bad time. This is, a, this is a, a good king has died. Things that were good are not good anymore. And listen, as we look at this, this is so relevant to us because we could all look around and think of, about all the things that are not good right now. There's a lot that has been good that's not good right now. And Isaiah's experience ought to be our experience because when we're confronted with the absence of a good man, when we're confronted with the absence of a good experience, a good year, our response is generally to be depressed, discouraged, and feel hopeless. But Isaiah, in the absence of seeing a good king, listen, he saw, he was captivated by a great God. This is the whole point, is that We shouldn't allow the bad news of the day and the absence of good things around us to distract us from a God that is greater than anything else that we are missing in this world. So so in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. With two he flew. And one called to the other saying these three words, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me. This is Isaiah's response to a great God. Woe is me for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand burning coal that he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Isaiah speaking, Here am I, send me. 
Isaiah 6 is a masterpiece. I mean, it's a beautiful text. In a moment, we're going to have the opportunity to actually sing this word to the Lord. We're going to be able to worship him by singing Isaiah 6 in, in a real way. But, but don't miss the practical application that we've got to grab a hold of here today. As we, as we say, yes, we're one church. We want to be unified. We want to push for unity, promote unity. We want to share this one prayer because we believe that if we all collectively, individually, but yet unified, have this prayer of God, would you shake the upstate of South Carolina? Would you make us the men and the women that you've called us to be? Would you lift us to this point of practical purpose so that the upstate of South Carolina would never be the same for your glory? That really is, that's only going to happen as we surrender to him. So the question is, how do we surrender? How do we even start surrendering? How do we take our first steps toward really practically surrendering our heart and lives. Two simple points today, all right, two simple points. Here's part of that prayer God uses, here it is. God, open our eyes. God, open our eyes. There's no way we're ever going to surrender until we open our eyes to who God is, and then subsequently, that will reveal quickly who we really are. And so that's step one, right? Notice that Isaiah saw the Lord in verse one, but he wasn't looking through a lens of selfishness. He wasn't looking through a lens of, of, of trying to make God who he wanted him to be. No, he, he saw him for who he really was. Uh, in verse one, this kind of how did Isaiah see him? Look at verse one. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. He was sitting on a throne high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. Three things quickly, right there in one verse. Look, first of all, the king was on his throne. And I mean, that's, that's where a king belongs. I mean, think about it. I mean, if there's anywhere a king should sit, it ought to be on his throne. But here's the question. Is he sitting on your throne? I mean, is he sitting on the throne of your life? I'm not talking about spiritually on Sunday morning, you know, making the statement, the Sunday school answer, you know, the thing you're supposed to say. Yes, Wayne, absolutely. Hey, God's on my, my, the throne of my heart. I've surrendered everything to him. I mean, like, practically speaking, is he sitting on the throne of your heart? Is he, is he in the place that he should be in your heart and your life? The next part's going to really confront us even further. Notice the position of the throne. It's high and lifted up. It's high and lifted up. It's not below. It's not subject to. It is above all. We just literally sang that. Isabel just knocked it out of the He's above all. He is above it all. He's above what all? He is above your job, your education, your family, your finances. He's above our children's recreation. He is above our entertainment. He's above our pleasure. He's above the Braves winning the World Series. Amen. Got to get that in there. He's above it. All right, let's say we tank the rest of the season. He's still bigger, man. He's greater. He's above it all. All the stuff we, we think is so important, man, it's going to be literally gone like mist in the wind tomorrow. Oh, but we all oh, I got to invest in this. I've got to do this now, man. Oh, yeah, I love God. I love God. He's right here. He's right here, but here's where I'm focusing. Here's where I'm putting all my time. Here's where I'm putting all my energy. Here's where I'm putting all my resources. Oh, but I love God. He's above it all. I raise my hands on Sunday. I, I sing at the top of my voice. I do everything I can to demonstrate publicly that I, I love God and I'm surrendered to him. But here's where I'm really investing my time. Here's where I'm really investing my energy. Here's where I'm really investing my finances. Oh, God's a good co-pilot. God is no one's co-pilot. He's no one's co-pilot. Look, he, he didn't come to help you out with your life. This is not the God of the Bible. God came to take control of your life. God came to, to capture me, to rescue me, to own me. This is the God that is on his throne, high and lifted up. He's not under our feet. He is not under our spell. He's not a genie in a bottle that is subject to my wishes. 
He is a God bigger than my greatest dreams. He's better than anything I could hope for. He's above it all. I mean, are we just singing a song or do we really believe it? I mean, are we just going to church and doing a religious thing? Or do, are, are we really sold out to the call of God? Here's why I know that we're not. Because if we, look, if 2,300, how many ever, if, if, if that many people, if 10 people truly sold out, I'm talking about surrendered their heart and life to Jesus Christ, completely, total abandonment, this state would be changed forever. I'm talking radical transformation. And this is why we're praying. This is why we're sharing one prayer. God, use us. Not conditional prayers. Not God use us as long as you don't want to get this. God use us as long as you don't want me to go there. God use us as long as it fits my schedule. No, not a conditional prayer of surrender, but God, truly, would you take control of my life? Let's go to the third thing real quick. Luke, it says the train of his robe filled the temple. I want to make sure you understand this is not he filled the temple. This is, he's bigger than that. See, he's, he's high and lifted up. He's, he's better than that. The train of his robe filled the temple. And I never want us to stop saying, God, would you meet us here? The presence of God is sweet. And I, I totally understand, and we all understand what we mean by that. When two or more gather you know, together in his name, he is there. We believe this. This is the word of God. He is present. But let's understand. Let's not be misled or misunderstand what, what this means. There is no building. Like, there's no building. There is no country. There's no planet that can contain the glory of God. There's nothing big enough to hold God. He's bigger than this building. And look, God doesn't, this may hurt our feelings, although God doesn't need upstate church. It is, it is beyond explanation to understand what a glorious opportunity we have to, to serve the God who is above it all. But, but he doesn't need these four walls. He is so big that the train of his robe would fill this building. The train of his robe. He's bigger than us. He's better than us. He's greater than us. And we need to say, God, would you open our eyes and remind us how big you are, how great you are, how worthy you are. You're more worthy than any sports team. You're more worthy of any member of my family, God. You are, you're, you're better. You're high and lifted up, and you are on the throne. I am not. But then verse 2, quickly. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. A three, a three Fold superlative is what that's called. Would you say those three words? Well, technically, one word three times with me. Holy, holy, holy. What's he mean? What's the significance of saying it three times? Well, this is pretty cool. Check this out. It's the only time in the Bible that there's a threefold superlative. I don't know about you, but it's a pretty big book. Anytime something only happens once, take note of it, right? Make sure we understand this is for emphasis as the angel says, holy, holy, holy. It's, it's definitely significant. So he's saying, here's what the word holy means. Separate, distinct. You could say it like this, a little wordy, odd. Other than. So here's what he's other than us. Put it in my kind of terms, simple man. He's in a category all to his own. There is no one like him. He is one of a kind. He is holy, holy, holy. There is no event on our calendar. There is no possession we long to hold. There is no job we are endeavoring to to actually occupy no position we ever could gain that even comes close to measuring up to the value of him. This is what the angels are saying. That holy, 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 separate, separate, separate. Why is that so important? A.W. Tozier said this, what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What, what comes in our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Look, why? Because it determines everything else. It really determines everything else. So how do you see God? This is the question. How do I see God today? As some spiritual symbol, as some religious tradition, as some genie in a bottle, as some good friend who listens, as some 
practical crutch or some moral obligation? Or do we see him as the God of the universe who is separate? He is holy. He, he, he is so loving that he would live inside of me and forgive me of my sins. But, but at the same time, he's so holy and separate that I can't even begin to catch a glimpse of his glory. Even this, this moment, I mean, the, the greatest moment of worship that you've ever had in, in your life was but a, a glimpse of the train of his garment because we could not possibly fathom or contain the holiness or the glory of God that we would experience if we truly saw him completely for who he really is. And so the truth is, uh, how we see God changes everything about us. And so that first prayer under uh, God use us is God open our eyes. Secondly though, listen, God forgive our sins. It's really a natural progression because when God opens our eyes, We see him for who he really is. And then as we see God for who he really is, we see ourselves for who we really are. And here's the deal. This is, I know, nobody's gonna leave thinking, boy, this was such a fuzzy message, Wayne. This is not that kind of thing. This is tough. This is tough. And listen to this. When I really do business with God and I recognize him for who he is, I'm never, I'm never, I'm never aware of who he is and I leave and respond to his presence by saying, Oh God, I, I know you're holy, but you understand that I'm a sinner. You know, I understand, and, and hey, you're gracious, and so I'm gonna live my life the way I want to. I'm gonna keep doing this deal the way I've been doing this deal, right? What's, the, what's, what's that reveal? I didn't see him for who he really is. I mean, that's all it means. When, when our response to seeing him is that we defend or maintain our own posture or our own willingness to, to we, we get to make our own decision, we're still in charge, we're behind the wheel, then we really missed him. We missed him altogether. I'm convinced, look, there, there's a great deal of people who think they're, they're saved and Christians in America, and they've never one moment surrendered one ounce of their life to Jesus Christ. It's not about being a church member, man. It's about literally, Bible here, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Jesus. Take up your cross, not take up your iPhone, right? Take up your cross, your instrument of torture. Be willing to die for Jesus. Man, honestly, we're, we're, not, we're not willing to surrender our schedule to Jesus. Most of the time, we're not willing to surrender our energy to Jesus. We're not willing to surrender our finances to Jesus. Now the question, most of the time, uh, definitely seen a reduction in the number of people in America, not just in our church, but who are answering the call to ministry, uh, who are answering the call to missions. I'm praying that in the next two years, we see an overwhelming tidal wave of people coming to surrender their heart and their life to Christ and calling. Here's why. Because when we see him for who he really is, all the other stuff in this life just fades in comparison because we recognize there is nothing I could choose in this world that compares to him. Anything I would lose, this is what Paul said, anything I would lose, man, it's counted loss. I want to follow Jesus. It's so much better to follow Jesus. What we gain is so much better than anything we could ever possibly lose. And so an acknowledgement of our sin, which is what Isaiah had in verse five, and then we see verse six and seven, it says we, that Isaiah, it was, his guilt was taken away, right? His guilt was taken away and his sin was atoned for. This is an amazing response from God to Isaiah's acknowledgement, woe is me. I'm a sinner. So not, oh, we see a holy God, we run from him. Or, oh, we see a holy God, uh, we're gonna just keep doing our deal. Let him be holy and we're gonna do whatever we want. No, woe is me. I'm, I'm unworthy. See, I, I wonder how many Christians would say that when they see God, they, they actually feel more, you know, uh, feel better about themselves. <laughs> you know, they, if, if feeling like, if feeling like the more you see God, the more you're impressed with your own righteousness, dude, you've, you've missed the boat. You've totally missed the boat. You've missed God because that's not the response. When we see God, we, we see ourselves for who we really are. We see a spiritual mirror and that mirror reveals we are broken. We are undone. We are surrounded by people who are broken 
and undone. And we need him. God, use us. God, use us. You see, the truth of the matter is, if we're gonna be a church that truly, I'm talking about in an uncommon way, surrenders to him, then it's gonna take all of us individually surrendering our lives to him. And I believe he'll use our church in a way that we can't even imagine. Every once in a while, I prepare a a video for all of our campuses. And today in particular, with this being like a vision message, a message looking toward future direction, I prepared a conclusion to the message um, that the other four campuses are gonna hear actually at the same time. And I felt that it was fitting, especially with the whole theme being one. Um, I thought it was fitting for you guys to hear the same thing at the same time. And so, after all, I mean, we are one. Hey, everybody. My name's Wayne Bray, lead pastor here at Upstate Church. I just want to say how proud I am to be a part of this team. Man, you've got an amazing teaching pastor. No matter what campus you're at today, uh, Dustin, Dallas, Will, Ashley, man, all four of them are fantastic. And I'm just grateful that uh, they're all part of the team of Upstate Church. And, and here's the cool thing. You're a part of that team, too. You know, this is 11 services, five campuses, thousands of people coming together in a common mission. That's really what brings us together is our love for Jesus and our desire to really follow in the footsteps that he has laid out for us. And so really that's what we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks. We started last Sunday in this series called One, introducing the One Initiative. We, we started by bringing unity and saying, hey, you know, this is what we're about together we can do more together than separately. We're better together, right? And so with that in mind, we talked about one church. Well, today we're talking about one prayer, and the prayer is God, use us. You've been looking at Isaiah chapter 6, and uh, man, I tell you what, no doubt a powerful passage where Isaiah in verse 1 of chapter 6 basically just sees God for who he really is, right? High and lifted up. But then by verse 5, his eyes are on himself, and he sees himself for who he really is. Woe is me. Man, I'm a sinner, right? And so we understand this is true of us in the same way. When we see God for who he really is, that's when we see ourselves for who we really are. And, and here's the kind of take home from here. When we see God for who he really is, we only have one natural response, at least only one good one, and that is... Man, we've got to go where he leads. We've got to do what he says. Our answer should be the same answer that Isaiah gave, and that is, here I am, send me. And so that's where we find ourselves even today. We, we, man, we're hearing the challenge from the word, and we recognize this is not a negotiable situation. We've got to really answer the call. We've got to, we've got to say, okay, what's my next steps? You know, what, what am I supposed to do with this information? Which is always the, the challenge when we're looking at a message, when we're hearing, uh, you know, our teaching pastor is like, no, we don't, we don't want to just hear good words. We want to, we want to see steps in our lives that actually mean something. And so here's the thing today. I want to challenge you with a next step. In the books that you received last week, if you didn't get it last week, you need to get it this week. It's a, it's a handbook, really, for the One Initiative. Uh, there's a, a, a kind of a copy of this card, and this card is going to be handed out next week on every campus. And so everybody here is going to have an opportunity to get this card next week. If you look at page 17, it's going to have it kind of laid out for you. You can go ahead and look at the specifics on this card. You may say, why are you talking about a card, man? We're, you know, we're talking about Isaiah 6. Well, again, we want to give you a practical tool. We want to give you like something in your hands to help you be obedient to the call of God in your life related to your part in this mission in the upstate. And so with that in mind, these next steps are going to be very specific. Uh, on that card, there are actually three different squares, all right? So if you look at that page 17, you're going to see three different squares there that basically outline three challenges, or I'll say it like this, three commitments that I'm going to make. I'm going to tell you, I've checked the boxes, man. And, and your teaching pastor, they've all checked the boxes. None of us are holding back. And those three boxes represent really commitments that we're willing to make. The first one is about last week. And as one church, this first commitment is, 
yeah, man, I'm committed to be an ambassador of unity. I'm, I'm willing to be a promoter of unity in upstate church. I'm all about cross-campus unity, bringing this thing together. We're one church, we're one body, and we're on one mission. And so with that in mind, that's all about unity, first box. And so if that's you, the next week when you get that card, bro, you need to check the box, all right? That, that's you. Second box is about surrender, all right? And so we're not just one church, but we all share one prayer. And this prayer is, God, use us. The same prayer Isaiah prayed in Isaiah 6, in that, in that whole moment of, here I am, send me, God. And so, God, use me, no matter what. Whatever the question is, my answer is yes. If that's you, then you need to check box two, because you're saying, man, I'm going to share that prayer with you. Wayne, I, I'm, I'm willing to pray that prayer with Dallas, with Dustin, with Will, with Ashley. I, I'm going to pray that prayer with you guys. Yes, God, use me. Whatever it means, man, I surrender. Now, here's the thing. Big elephant in the room, there's a financial component under surrender. But I don't want you to get distracted from your commitment to the whole because of your reluctance with the part. And so, look, don't, don't get messed up or sidetracked because you see a dollar figure. Here's what I... I do believe is so true about this initiative. All right, this commitment card is not so much about you surrendering your finances as it is about you surrendering your life. And so look, if, if you're here and you're like, man, forget the money thing, here's what I'm telling you. The question is, are you willing to surrender your life? If your answer is yes, check that box, all right? Not just number one, but number two. Now, I would encourage you to go ahead and look at that. What am I giving right now? What will I give for the next two years? That's a total number for the next two years. And then what's a one-time gift on the big give? The reason that's important is it helps me to actually put it down on a piece of paper to hold me accountable. I'm actually making a commitment. But then in addition to that, it does help us plan ahead as far as a church. So I would encourage you to put that. But look, don't miss the, the big point. And that is, yes, one church, unity, one prayer, I'm surrendering. And then the third part of that, if you'd say, what's the, the last part of my commitment next week? Seven days from now, you're going to have an opportunity to turn in this commitment card. And that third square is about you saying, I'm willing to be a witness. And I'm willing to, to, to give my one life and devote it toward trying my very best to reach one life. I, I want to go all in in the sense of evangelism. Man, I want to I want to share my faith. I want to be a witness. So yeah, my neighbor, my community, my, the person across the hall in the dorm, you know, or or the man I, or woman I work with or my family member, no matter who it is, yeah, God, the next 2 years, I want to I want to be an instrument that you use. I want to be your hands and your feet. I want to bring somebody to Jesus. That's a huge commitment. And that's really that's all it's about, man. This initiative is about those three things. So the question is not are there clear next steps out of this message? Man, they are in your face. <laughs> they're, they are there. It's not a question of, I don't really know what to do. No, the question is, are you willing to do it? The question is, am I willing to be a promoter of unity? Am I willing to do everything that God calls me to do? I'll surrender it all. And am I willing to, to share my faith and to be a witness over the next couple of years? Uh, the next seven days, I want you to look at page 17 a lot, man. Look through the contents of the book. Really pray about it every day. What are you asking, God, of me? What should I give of myself, of my time, of my resources? And then am I invested enough in this church? Am I really one enough to put it on a piece of paper and to bring it to the altar next Sunday and to leave it there? And that's a big question. And I think it's one that we all need to answer. Here, here's the truth. When we see God for who he really is, there really is only one acceptable response. And that is that we do what he says to do. We go where he leads us. And our answer is just like Isaiah's. Here I am. Send me. Here's the question. Are you Jonah, Abraham, or Isaiah? They were all called, and here's the thing. They eventually all obeyed in different ways. Jonah was called. He ran. Basically, his response was, no way, right? Moses was called, and he just made excuses. 
At the end of the day, Moses basically said, find someone else. Find somebody else more talented. You know, they're better at serving in that area. They, may, they, they got more money. They got more resources. Use them. I mean, I, what have I got to give? That's Moses, man. Moses said, find somebody else. Isaiah said, here I am. God, take whatever I've got to give and send me. I hope and pray as we sing this song and as we think and pray about the next seven days, our part in this mission, that we'll really ask God, God, what is it you want me to do? And that our question won't be, will I commit? But God, what do you want me to commit? Because my answer is yes. Would you stand with us?